I cannot think of anyone who is more qualified to talk on this topic. Uh, this guy is uh, Nilan Perez. He is the growth VP of TransferWise, and he is going to talk about how to grow, grow big without spending a lot of money. He is the man to talk about this topic. Please have a round of applause for Nilan. Dude. Matt, whoa, that was a build-up, wasn't it? All right, uh, so uh, I'm Nilan. I like uh, working with startups, and I like tequila. So that's uh, introductions out of the way. Um, a little bit more about me. So um, I'm um, currently VP Growth at TransferWise, and uh, that means I spend my time working with uh, the product teams and with the marketing teams uh, as well. Uh, before that, I spent some time working with early stage startups. Uh, worked with about 20. Uh, some of them have died. Uh, <laughs> some of them have grown, which is kind of cool. One of them was, uh, was transferwise. And uh, I've worked uh, before that doing a bunch of stuff I don't normally talk about. Uh, but onwards, and let's talk a little bit about traction. Uh, so how many people in the audience are currently working uh, with startups? Awesome. And uh, so you know what traction means, it's this kind of uh, mythical thing. Uh, it's these graphs that go up and off to the right, yeah. Is anyone who's working in a startup, does, uh, does your user numbers or your revenue numbers look like that yet? Cool, because if they do, you shouldn't be here. <laughs> so you're all, your numbers look more kind of like, uh, so you're here basically, yeah. And uh, so your numbers really look more like that, really. And really what you're trying to figure out is, uh, are you ever going to get to traction? And that, I think, is the most exciting time. Uh, I call that being in the, in the death zone. Because uh, you've got kind of six months of cash, three months of cash in the bank, uh, two or three people in the room, and you're trying very hard to prove that this thing works. And what I'm going to talk through is uh, just the stuff I've learned on uh, how to approach that time. And hopefully get to there. So how, how do we get out of the death zone? So um, what I'm going to do is take you through a, a typical conversation that I, uh, I used to have with early stage founders when I, when I had time to spend uh, helping out startups. And uh, I'm going to uh, anonymize uh, the characters I'm using here, using uh, characters from The Wire. Uh, I'm not sure if The Wire's made it to Estonia, but it is the best TV series ever made, hands down. So go check it out. So uh, basically, that's Christo on the left and Tava on the right, OK? <laughs> Just in case you're wondering how this dialogue goes. Uh, so like, when I met the guys, it, this wasn't Christo and Tava, but just go with me on this one. So when I, when I met the guys, the conversation goes normally like, uh, dude, we're running out of cash in six months. What are we going to do? Let's go see the man, like a VC. He can give us funding. Introducing the man. That's Nick uh, from Forward Partners, one of the VCs in London. He says, uh, come back when you're growing. OK, cool. All right. We need to grow. We need to find customers. You know what we need? Ah, we need marketing. Cool. Marketing costs money. Like, where are we going to get money? Let's go see the man. And then you're kind of stuck. Uh, so is there another way to get out of it? And so the reason I, I, I do this talk is because I think it's really fucking confusing when you're an early stage startup because everyone's giving you advice and you don't know where to focus. And the one thing I think you should focus on early stage is your customers and focus very hard on your product and get your product to work. And um, I'll talk through uh, one way that uh, we do it at, at TransferWise, which is this, this thing around NPS-driven growth. So uh, NPS stands for uh, Net Promoter Score. As this kind of question you ask your customers, would you recommend us to your friends? You've probably seen this question, and there's a kind of scale between 0 and 10. People that give you a 9 or 10 on that scale, you call promoters, kind of assume they go around saying, that thing is like amazing. You need to try it out. And people who give you a 1 to 6, uh, we call detractors. So you kind of assume they go around saying, never, ever go anywhere near this. And people who give you a 7 and 8, Kind of like, meh. And uh, the way you calculate NPS is you take the detractors away from the promoters and kind of express it as a percentage. And it's kind of cool because you can like see what different uh, 
different companies' MPSs are. So I, I used to work uh, in the travel industry, and it kind of blew my mind. Uh, the travel industry's MPS is zero. <laughs> it's crazy. Even like Expedia's is only like 30%. Google's and Apple's is kind of around about 60%. But the cool thing about MPS is if you continue to grow MPS, that means uh, you've got these people going around saying, this product is great. You should use it, and they tell one person who tells another person who tells another person who tells another person, which means it grows. So it's kind of cool. So now we've got a metric or a question that if we keep trying to get people to answer the right way, and we figure out and we try to understand exactly what they're saying, and we get inspired to build the right kind of product, then, uh, then we'll grow. But if everyone could do that, everyone would have done that. So this isn't easy. So let's just, again, just step through the, the, the process of being in an early stage startup. So you, you come up with an idea, uh, you get it out the door, it's pig ugly, you don't want to show it to anyone really, but you just ship it anyway. And it just about works. Uh, and then you fix some of those issues. It's less painful for people to use, it's kind of cool. And then you start polishing it. But in order to get to advocacy, to people telling their friends about your product, you need to aspire to blow your customer's socks off. You really need to go the extra mile. Um, anyone here working on uh, a mobile phone app? Cool. Good luck. It's like really hard. <laughs> so why is why a mobile phone app uh, startups hard? Because growing them is really hard. And growing them is hard because you can't just so say I create Yo, right? Uh, I I can't like create some marketing and target it at everyone who's going to use Yo because it just doesn't exist. So the way in which mobile phone apps grow, if you think about it, is uh, you download an app and uh, it's cool, and then you tell your friend about it. And whilst you're selling, you sell it. You sell it to your friend, and while you're selling it to them, they're taking it out and they're downloading it. And essentially, because mobile app distribution is so broken, uh, the only mobile phone apps that succeed are apps that have off-the-scale high NPS. Uh, and it's interesting, when I talk to mobile phone startups, um, they kind of tell me, uh, we basically try to ship things, and it either goes boom, and if it doesn't go boom, we tear it all up and we start again. So, <laughs> Part of the reason I, uh, I joined TransferWise, I was really kind of seduced by this idea of how, how, do, you, uh, how do you get a, a business to massive scale through just focusing on product? And I, uh, I spent a bit of time hanging out with some of the guys, say, at Uber or an Airbnb and a few other places, and no one's actually kind of systemized and tried to figure out how to do that. So I'll share some of the, the things that we've figured out so far about this. So what drives recommendations? Why do people actually tell their friends? Through talking to lots of customers, it, we kind of found out that people recommend for rational reasons and emotional reasons, and everyone exists in a kind of shade of gray somewhere in between. And the rational stuff, when you listen to them and they're recommending, they're, they're just talking about the product. And the emotional stuff, they're talking about the brand, what you stand for. Just to, to make it practical, with TransferWise um, and with your products that you're building, you should be able to figure out what are the parameters of your product. So for us, it's around speed, price, convenience, the currency corridors we're on. And what we've seen with these, with these things is like, yep, you can, put, you, you can put KPIs on this. But you see your customers kind of tell their friends, you've got to use TransferWise because it's fast. You've got to use TransferWise because it's really cheap. You've got to use TransferWise because it's really easy to use. And uh, what we see, though, is you need to be an order of magnitude better than the alternative to get advocacy. So banks charge 5%. If we charged 4.8, we might get a customer. But you wouldn't tell your mum. But banks charge 5 and we charge 0.5. So if you transfer 1,000 pounds a month, you save 50 pounds each time. You do that four times, you save 200 pounds, you're going on holiday, and then you tell all your friends, I'm going on holiday because I transferwise. It's kind of cool. 
but you need to aspire to be an order of magnitude better than the alternative. And, and obviously, you do it because you need to grow, but you also do it because you believe that's the way the world should be. And that's what comes across in your brand, and I think that's how you create a movement. So, uh, how does this help you get out of the death zone? Yep, uh, focusing on product, delighting your customers, and you will grow. So, how does that actually help you as an early stage startup? Because uh, MPS, you can only really get to when you've got a few thousand customers at least, uh, otherwise it's just not enough data. And so I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, take you through uh, uh, three practical tips uh, for super early stage startups, um, which hopefully will be helpful. So the first one is get your product to work. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's a friend of mine, Andreas Klinger. Uh, he's... Uh, He's currently CTO at uh, Product Hunt. He's one of, uh, one of the best growth people around. And he's got a blog post. If you Google it, you can find it. He says there's only one report you need when you're an early stage startup. And this is the, this is the report. So basically, this is a report that shows all your customers and the last time they visited your website or the last time they used your app. And you color green anyone who used your app in the last week. You color amber, anyone who used it in the last two weeks. And you color red, anyone who used it more than two weeks ago. And then your job is to make everyone go green. And you talk to every single one of those people and try to understand what would it take in order for them to go green to figure out, can you get your app to that point? And I thought that's a pretty cool, super helpful way of just getting through the where do I focus, where, what should I do tomorrow, and help you get to that point. The second tip is to find your scaling metric. So I think startups are prioritization problems. So one of the things I've learned in life is that uh, people can only do one thing at a time, especially engineers. <laughs> you definitely can't do two things at a time. So to do one thing at a time, you've got to put things in a list. And then you need to start at the top of the list, and you need to cross things off. But to put things in a list, you need to be able to order them, so you know what to do first. To be able to order stuff, you need to be able to measure it and say, I think this will have the biggest impact. So one of the, the next things to do is to try to get to the point where you've got some kind of heuristic to say, I know what I should be doing tomorrow and define success as, I went to sleep tonight, and I know that what I've done has had the single biggest impact that, on the, my product that I could have done. And if you're not at that point, think through what you need to do to get to that point. And if you're in that point, then you know that you're doing everything you can do to move your startup forward. Uh, I'll give you some examples of these scaling metrics, because uh, they're quite counterintuitive. Um, so I worked uh, as VP Growth at Housetrip, uh, a holiday rental startup. We were briefly the Airbnb of Europe before Airbnb became the Airbnb of Europe. That's another story. Uh, but at Housetrip, supply was the biggest growth lever. So I am looking for a holiday rental in London. You either have it or you don't. I'm looking for one uh, near Oxford Circus. You either have that or not. I'm looking for one near Oxford Circus that costs 50 pounds and has two bedrooms. So just being able to have that supply at the right range enables you to convert. And again, you can start figuring out, I'm going to rank from Google all the searches of all the destinations to figure out which destination I should focus on. I'm going to understand what those customers are looking for. And then I'm going to systemically go and start working my way down that list and getting the supply we need. More esoterically, uh, Facebook's uh, metric is around engagement. It's, just, it's absolutely insane for me still that 90% of the UK checks Facebook every day. Like, wow. It's just amazing just thinking through someone, you could think the product that you're building today, 90% of the UK could use it every day. And that's a very simple metric. It's like you can kind of see it when you're using the product. They're optimizing for engagement. They're optimizing to get you back to the site. Every feature in there, they're thinking through, does that drive engagement or it doesn't drive engagement? How they drive to news feed, how they drove to photos, the big things that drove the, the changes in the growth rate and the stickiness of the product. Okay, so marketing does play a role. But it isn't a panacea. It's not the silver bullet that everyone tells you it is that's going to come and solve all your growth problems. It's very dangerous to even, even look at it that way. 
But marketing that amplifies your product and amplifies what you stand for and the change in the world can be really powerful. But it also comes in many forms. So yep, there's above the line marketing, performance marketing, all that kind of stuff. But there's viral marketing as well. And viral marketing and recommendation mechanisms that sit on top of NPS are incredibly powerful for early stage startups and for uh, mobile app startups especially. Because they sit on top of the stuff you're doing already in product to drive growth. No one's going to recommend, no one's going to like send an invite link uh, out for Dropbox if they hate the product. They've got to love the product first. And even more, again, uh, tangentially, I also think there's massive opportunities to uh, get your product or your app to uh, have acquisition built into it. And uh, kind of one kind of canonical example is LinkedIn. So you go to LinkedIn and you create a profile page, and then they create a page like this for you. That that's the page that Google crawls. So that's what your profile looks like when you're not logged in. And then you start telling your friends, hey, I got this LinkedIn profile. Here's a link to it. Or your friends, or when you put, attach it to your CV. And before you know it, when you start searching for me, that page pops up. But I've seen people take that kind of um, SEO hack and apply that to, uh, to other completely different kinds of industries as well. Um, so just in closing, um, the final part I'll just talk through is kind of where does this go? How does this scale? So I think we've heard a little bit around uh, a transferwise. I won't, I won't labor the point, but we, we work in these teams uh, which are autonomous and independent, focused on KPIs that make our customers happy and growth and drive our growth. And um, so each team is, ki is kind of behind one of the growth levers. And, and the way to think about how, we've, how it scales is effectively each of our teams is a startup. And each of our teams is, is trying to focus on one of those KPIs that we've learned matters to our customers. It could be launching a currency, making payments faster, reducing speed, making the experience more convenient, etc. And uh, therefore, you end up in this place where, where every, everyone works on product. And actually, in a way, everyone works on growth and understands uh, how they can influence it. And one of, the, one of the big things to try to maintain in that is, is to maintain the reality that you're working in a startup, even when you're operating in that mode. And what I mean by that is that, so right now, I mean, the last number we went public with was we're processing half a billion, half a billion uh, payments a month, and we've doubled in size every three to four months uh, to date. But nobody knows how to get to being 4x our size in a year's time. But everyone believes they can. And everyone's trying to understand what would it take. So what would it take for a customer to tell x many more friends? What would it take in China for a customer to recommend TransferWise to their friends? What would it take uh, for our movement to spread beyond 20-something hipsters in London to 40-somethings in the north of England? And no one's, no one's ever done that before. And we're clear no one's ever done that before. But we're also clear what the impact that could have on the world. And that's kind of how, operating that way is kind of how we've gone from having 60 to 430 people uh, in something close to a year and a half. So just to summarize, focus on NPS and you'll grow. Find your single metrics, talk to customers, and add marketing only when ready. Cool, and that's me. We got time questions. Yeah. Cool. Okay. I was uh, just myself listening to talk. Lovely talk. Thank right. you. How are you doing this step three incentivization that where like you're using the Dropbox example, recommend yeah. to your friends, get some extra gigabytes. What's what does TransferWise do in that area? Do you have what have you built onto that layer? So uh, we try everything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Literally tried everything, and uh, just through trying everything, you figure figure out what works. Okay. Uh, surprisingly, like the simple stuff works, like giving people money. It works really, really well, and it's hard to find anything better than that. Right. But, uh, yeah. What is, what, besides money, what else have you tried that's been at least a little bit something? I mean, I think, the no, we've tried furry animals, chocolates, everything, uh, literally everything. Okay. Uh, and yeah, 
So with, with money, it's sort of what you've, you've taken off some of the fees or something? Is so that yeah, the way you're both, money? both ways around it. So yeah. one is uh, we, you take off the fees, but also just cold, hard cash. Just handing out cash. Yeah, totally. All right, right cash, on. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, why don't we go to the crowd for some questions for Nilan? Anyone? Does anyone have a question for Nilan? Cool. Up there. Have a microphone, sir. So when should a startup invest in marketing and why? It's a good question. So uh, uh, there are two schools of thought on this. Um, uh, one school of thought is when you can. Okay. And the second school of thought is uh, as late as possible. And uh, we definitely have both uh, competing schools of thought at TransferWise. So um, the when you can point is uh, marketing costs money. Mm -hmm. So in order to... Uh, in order to in order to invest in marketing, you're going to have to have raised cash to spend on it. And the only way you'll raise cash is if, you, if you're growing a little bit. So the moment you get to a, a usually a 10% month on month, 20% month on month at least growth rate, you're in a place where people should be able to give you money. And then you can go raise money and, and spend it on marketing. It's quite dangerous to like, you know, uh, collect, say, 10,000 pounds from your friend and spend it on marketing because you'll get a kick but then you're out of cash, and it's very rarely will feed itself to keep it going. Right, so it's like you need that traction. The marketing will only work if you've already got traction yeah, to yeah, go yeah. forward with that marketing. Not like you were saying that you need, uh, you need the, the growth to show the investor who will give you the money, yeah. but then it's almost like the cycle back around. You need then that traction you've already got to yeah. go forward. You won't, marketing may not work so much from a standing start. Totally. Uh, it's right. quite dangerous to add it in at that point. Does that help? Yeah, cool. Right, okay, because you're just paying up, like, it, it, people need to, right, okay. It, I'm not, sorry, I'm just commenting. Now, I'm just realizing no, that's, that's, that's no, so really the danger, point the, danger, like, the, yeah, da the dangerous place that first. you end up in is the kind of, like, I, I spend a load of money on marketing, I lose a load of money, then I go and borrow a bit more, and then I lose a bit more, and then that way lies insanity. So, uh, yeah, I don't recommend it. Okay, very good. Any other questions? Go Sir, down here. Sorry, say again, sir. Okay, uh, yeah. sorry. Yo. Uh, so you said you, in the beginning when you invest in marketing, it is just a kick you get out of it. Mm. But maybe in some cases, the, this is the kick you need for uh, investors to invest. I, yeah, but I, and some investors do absolutely inv invest in things with that kind of kick. Uh, and they like that because they know they'll, that you'll need to still keep taking money from them <laughs> in order right. to spend it on marketing. And then they kind of like rub their hands because they get more and more stake in your business. And, uh, but still, eventually, uh, you hit a wall uh, with that route. Um, there's very few startups that can do that and get out of it in that way. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll tell you a story about us. So how we, um, how we got to traction. So marketing is important. We had, a, we had this great product uh, for moving money around the world. Uh, you guys know how it works. Uh, but we didn't grow for like uh, two years, a year and a half. And uh, our first uh, marketing uh, guy, uh, Joe Cross, likes to say, people don't talk about money transfer in the pub. <laughs> so we had to give our customers stories to talk about. And that's where a lot of the swearing in adverts, stripping naked, all that crazy stuff comes from. Um, and I think approaching it in that way is completely different from uh, uh, trying to approach it in any other kind of way. Now, there's absolutely cases, but they're much less these days, where you can build a business with what's called strong unit economics, meaning you're earning a load of money off every customer, uh, that you then can push onto Google, and you're earning more than anyone else does there, so you'll, you'll grow off the back of Google. But that's much, much rarer these days. Okay, cool. Coming back to actually your point, what you said earlier, uh, in my business, which is to produce stand-up comedy shows, yep. um, you were talking a little bit about, well, if you have an extra, if you do some marketing, does that give you a kick? Yep. Can that give you the kick? What I found is just a very, we don't do a lot of paid marketing. Yep. We're very social, people sharing, people want to share our events. But just a little bit of marketing around town can actually inspire my comedians. So now our staff, let's say, are more motivated. They see a poster, they see yep. maybe even a newspaper article, they get inspired, and then they want to do a better job so maybe the marketing in that instance wasn't, wasn't totally. even for the customers necessarily but the end product becomes better because the staff are motivated now obviously that can't scale to massive amounts but yeah. just a little bit just a hit well, that's right? a really good point i think that's a very underused idea so we we did try this so like market to your existing customers okay. make them feel proud and get them to tell your friends right friends. okay back and forth um someone had a question here about 
uh, transfer wise, I, I, here we are right now, is kind of known for its, uh, not only its kind of stunts or big things, but its events. I mean, you guys do good events. And yeah, we have great MCs. <laughs> so we're not paid enough. No, I'm <laughs> but um, I'm kidding. And yeah, um, yeah but how does, uh, <laughs> how does, event, how does the, you know, events are clearly a big thing for you guys and winning hearts and minds, I yeah. guess. Uh, so yeah, I'll talk a little that. bit about that. So, um, uh, so initially, when we started on the whole like stunts and that kind of stuff, it was just, uh, we're scared we're going to die. We're an angry young startup. Let's start off positioning ourselves against the bank, swearing lots, doing everything we could do. Mm. And then something happened around the time we rebranded to the flag symbol. Uh, and I remember it was September last year, we sent out this email to our customer base. And it was a manifesto of the world we wanted to build. And uh, it had this kind of great line in it, you don't need uh, banks to move money, you just need enough people. And people started forwarding that email around. And we acquired more customers from people forwarding that email than anything we'd done previously. Forward email? Who does that? Exactly. Wow. And yeah, not I even know. an email that's got pictures of naked people in it, right? Yeah, We're yeah, yeah not like even a joke with Comic <laughs> exactly, Sans. Exactly. From, yeah, yeah. exactly. But it was at that point, we kind of like started realizing that this thing is actually a movement now. And so... Um, we end up today, like I think 60% of our fans on Facebook aren't our customers and couldn't be our customers. They just buy into what we stand. So doing things like lobbying the government in the UK to change the law to make it illegal for banks to hide fees in the exchange rate, that, things like that, that, that demonstrate what we stand for, that creates this kind of collective movement both inside, I think, and outside uh, of TransferWise, which gives us momentum. Okay, cool. uh, one more question here from the Twitter. Uh, talking, going back to the idea of uh, the really early stage stuff before you have traction you've got a little bit of money uh you've got kind of no traction right now uh, and you were talking a little bit before about that you need to just focus on the today what is the most important thing i can do today can you talk a little bit more about that you know i've got nothing right yep. now how am i just getting rolling to begin with um so what exactly was the question so what what exactly was the question? What should I do? Yeah, so if you're at that start, yeah. you, you're not moving forward at all because yeah. it's just dropped right now. That's cool. Is it just you evangelizing personally, trying to get out there? No, is no, it no, no I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend that. So there's one very important question you should be asking yourself through this period, which is, should I give up? Okay. <laughs> and you really need to optimize your time to figure that out sooner rather than later. Okay. Oh. So uh, you start with... Um, you start with talking to customers. So like you, you get your app out there and you show it to people and you give it to your friends and then you see whether they use it. And if they don't use it, you've got a problem. And if they haven't told anyone and it's not growing itself, you've mm. got a problem. And so you just keep talking to them till you figure out, are they actually ever going to use this? What's the single thing I need to do that will get them to use it? Is that enough? Is that, all right, they're using it, but is it good enough to tell their friends? And just work your way through that person by person by person until, uh, until you've got it moving. And then also keep asking yourself, are they ever going to use it? <laughs> I guess that's powerful because that first group of people are your friends. Like you have direct access. Right now, you probably have to kind of work hard to get to your, you've got so many people yeah. using TransferWise, but these guys are, you, know, sure. these, you, you can talk to these people exactly. face to face. And if, and you, can, if you can pitch these guys and they're not pitching it to their friends, then you really have, uh, you've got to work hard on it. You've definitely got a problem. Okay, very good. Maybe one or two just quickly from the audience if we have any more. Yes. How yeah. do you know if your marketing is working? Cool, so I, I got the question, I'll repeat it. So how do you know if your marketing is working? Do you know if it's product or it's marketing? This definitely was something that almost paralyzed us for uh, I think about a year or two. And I remember when I, I started a few full time, like uh, lots of people were saying to me, so why do we grow? Which was basically what, in a very Estonian way. And, and what they meant was like, what is it that actually makes a difference? Is it this product stuff or is it this marketing stuff? And I think, so I do believe, uh, we, I do believe in being data-driven on this. I think having engineers forces you to be very data-driven and very rational on this. And so we absolutely try to get down to the point of understanding what is the incremental value of a Facebook ad versus uh, how much did the invite program bring in versus what was the impact of that stunt. And the point for that isn't to do some crazy analytical exercise. The biggest reason why you should try to get very good at that is because you learn, but also because you learn what you need to do more of. It's the only way in which you'll learn how to move your KPI and to grow the business.
But then let's say you're you're talking about the, the stunts. You use something. You two first two things are very analytical. Mm. The, the the like the step three incentivization mm. or Facebook ads. But then you said doing out public events or like doing yeah. Yeah, walking naked or something. How do you measure that? Yeah. So it's hard. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk you through a couple of ways in which we measure it. So one way is just uh, so I can tell you when uh, the months we do stunts, uh, our word of mouth goes crazy. And so right. we literally see, we literally systemically ask our customers, how did you hear about us? And they but again, word of mouth, what are you using social me media measuring tools? No, how do you measure word we, of we mouth? We literally ask our customers, so how right, did you okay. hear about us? And they say, oh, I heard from a friend. And then we'll say, can you give us their email address so we can thank them? The moment you do that, you can kind of do split tests on, uh, mm. if we do this, do more people tell their friends? Uh, and that's the kind of stuff we use to figure out. Uh, some things you can't measure too well. Some things you just do a big bang, and if it's big enough, you can see before and after. But uh, some things, uh, yeah, we try as much as possible not to make leaps of faith because uh, you make too many leaps of faith, you have no idea what's, what's working and what's work not working anymore. I think we'll take one more question. All right, no, we won't. Okay, cool. Chris. Lovely. All right, thank you very much, Nilan. Thank no you worries. very much. Cheers.